paradigm of political liberalism, inspired in this case by studies on the actual age and multiple modernities, leads us to ask whether democratic cultures uh, anchored in diverse civilizational context may generate multiple versions, different versions of the just and stable society of free and equal citizens. Now, various ideal types of democratic ethos then can be distinguished if we bracket the points of convergence and if we focus instead on just two points of divergence. One being the idea of the priority of rights over duties, and the other one being the role of political conflict within a democratic polity. Now, the idea of a priority of subjective rights, rights as prerogatives of the single individual against authority and potentially against the whole political community, that idea runs against the grain of most religious approaches to communal life. And the other point of friction concerns the role of contestation. Right-centered democracies somehow institutionalize Machiavelli's reflections on the positive role of conflict, of the conflict between nobility and commoners in the Roman Republic. Now, political cultures steeped in Catholic, Muslim, Confucian, Buddhist, Hindu backgrounds, even when they do prize pluralism, majority rule, the separation of powers, they do so with a kind of instinctive aversion to conflict and contestation, which gives a different pleasure to their democratic ethos. So then provisionally, the pluralization of the democratic ethos must start from construing four versions of it. The combination of an agonistic and right-centered view of the democratic process resonates only with the Puritan version of Christianity in the English-speaking world mostly. However, agonistic contestation could be combined not with a rights-oriented, but with a duty-oriented political culture, which emphasizes instead the political mediation of conflict over juridified litigation. A mix that is found in all forms of strong republicanism. Think of ancient Athens, uh, the Roman Republic, Venice and the Florentine Republic, and the Puritan Republic of Cromwell. On the, what I call the consociationalist side, so those who prize the, the priority of duties, uh, some democratic cultures combine both aversion to conflict and the centrality of duties, as the case might be with the Islamic retributive uh, understanding of rights, the Confucian emphasis on harmony as a normative concept, and with Buddhism. On the other hand, we also have democratic regimes, fully democratic regimes, that formally, formally endorse the priority of rights, but do so with a strong aversion to democratic contestation. I'm thinking here of Italy's formerly Christian democratic dominated polity before Berlusconi came along. Uh, I'm thinking of pluriconfessional Belgium and Switzerland and Germany's practice of concertation. Concertation. Now, these four additions that I just mentioned, so conjectural arguments and enriched notion of the democratic ethos, a decentering of the democratic ethos in several local varieties, as well as the uh, remedial model of a multivariate democratic polity, altogether jointly enable political liberalism to meet the challenge of hyper pluralism. But I, let me go back to my tripartite title. Uh, that shows that signal, uh, signals that my main point today uh, aims to be broader than that. Uh, uh, last year, uh, Brexit and the presidential election in this country have made it evident that the most insidious challenge for liberal democracy today comes not from the comprehensive conceptions of newly incoming citizens, but from within, from a political resentment that seeks representation and can carry the electoral day. These adjustments that I mentioned earlier, uh, they can do something, they can lead us some way towards meeting the challenge of hyperpluralism, but are not enough to meet the challenge of what I call indigenous unreasonability. Uh, now, 
The challenge of coming to terms with the partial reasonability of new constituencies, the immigrant constituencies, that difficulty pales by comparison with the challenge of coping with the rise of what I call indigenous unreasonability, something that in Europe we begin to experience over 20 years ago, back when the Berlusconi government still looked like an anomaly to be laughed at. And my intention today is to focus on what political liberalism as a paradigm can tell us about this new phenomenon and on what can be done to contain its effects. Normative political philosophy, which is often bashed for its propensity for ideal theory, today is called upon to perform a much more modest task, namely damage assessment and control. And the first task is to understand what the various political phenomena Uh, uh, grouped under the name of populism have in common. I move here to this uh, uh, section on populism as indigenous unreasonability. Populism risks becoming an umbrella term for many different things. And prominent constitutionalists, I'm thinking here of Bruce Ackerman, prefer not to use it. But I'm somewhat confident that we can tame this extreme diversity of manifestations and bring them to one common denominator. Think of, uh, a, by way of uh, imagining, focusing on this variety, uh, right-wing populism, the kind of populism of the National Front in France, the UK Independence Party, the Northern League in Italy, um, Dansk Folke Party in, uh, in, in Denmark, the Sweden Democrats, the Finns Party, called, previously called the True Finns, the Dutch Party for Freedom, the Belgium Flams, Flams Belang, or Flemish Interest Party, then Alternative für Deutschland, and then Golden Dawn in, uh, in Greece. And on the other hand, we have left-wing populism. Think of Podemos in Spain or Syriza in Greece, the Five Star Movement in Italy, though there's much to be said for that, and the historical Latin American examples of Peron, Chavez, Morales would count as left-wing uh, populism. Then we have appeals to the people on the part of ruling authoritarian figures. Think of Erdogan in Turkey or Orban in Hungary. And manifestations of what I call muscular democracy. Think of uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi, the Modi, this Modi's decision in India uh, on, to withdraw widely used 501,000 rupees notes from circulation on a four hour notice, throwing the country in utter uh, chaos. Now, Rawls's paradigm directs our attention to one crucial feature underlying these diverse manifestations. An indigenous unreasonability arising from within native constituencies that were previously integral to the constitutional consensus. And unreasonability can be understood, I claim, both from the point of view of theory uh, and from a common sense angle. And let me try to spell out what I mean by that. It is easier to say, first of all, what populism is not uh, than to say what it is. It is not, it cannot be reduced to the ideology of a specific social class, embraced by farmers and peasants in the 19th century in the US and in Russia. Populism later became the preserve of the lower middle class to resurface in the 21st century within a despondent uh, 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 working class. <coughs> Second, defining populism merely as resentment against the elites or as anxiety vis-a-vis -vis downward mobility obscures the political core of populism. It just psychologizes it. Third, it is impossible to associate populism with certain policies given the variety of orientations that it can assume, left wing, right wing, and so on. Fourth, populism cannot be understood as the preserve of oppositional movements. Some of the lines of uh, President Trump's inaugural address, reminiscent of President Chavez's claim that within, within in charge, the people rule, leave, in my opinion, no doubt as to that. Uh, quoting from him, we're transferring power from Washington DC and giving it back to you, the people. And then also January 20th, 
2017 will be remembered as the day the people became the rulers of this nation again. Finally, populism cannot be equated with the rejection of representative democracy in favor of direct democracy. Often populist movements do accept elections and representative institutions in their effort to wring them from the corrupt elite. So although it may comprise some of the above elements, populism coincides with none of these features. Political liberalism and its core standard of reasonability linked with public reason, in my opinion, directs direct our attention to three aspects of populism that together add up to this common denominator that we're seeking, which for brevity's sake, I just call indigenous unreasonability. And these three aspects are the following. First, the people qua democratic sovereign is conflated with the electorate or with the actual voters, which in some cases do not go beyond 50% of those who have the right to vote, uh, and the electorate with the nation. Second, as the embodiment of the people, the electorate is attributed constituent power. And third, only one legitimate interpretation of the common, common good is deemed to exist, all different opinions being detrimental to the people and to its de democratic life. The burdens of judgment are inoperative in populist reason, and so the liberation is superfluous and is a vehicle of destruction. Let me briefly now illustrate these three aspects of populist unreasonability. First, the first one, the people is the electorate, and the electorate is the nation. Now, the people is a crucial element of all democratic order. We just need to recall the reference to we the people in the preamble of the Constitution, the US Constitution, or the Lincolnian uh, government of the people, by the people, for the people, which also appears in Article 2 of the French Constitution. The difference uh, of these references to the people, uh, the difference with the populist understanding of the people lies in how we, to use Claude Lefort's uh, famous expression, how we extract the people from the people, or actually tell who among all the persons residing within a given political space the people truly is. Now, populist forces provide three oversimplified responses to the difficulty of identifying the actual people. The first oversimplification consists of seeing the people as a homogeneous, or really just trivially differentiated, social entity. Once the corrupted, self-serving, predatory oligarchies have been removed, the second simplification consists of understanding all the institutional segments of a democratic polity as corrupt bodies in the hands of the elites and standing in the way of the empowerment of the people. And the third simplification consists of understanding the unity of the people as grounded not so much in the quality of social relations, think of uh, Rawls's uh, famous expression, the idea of society as a union of social unions, but understanding the people instead as an identity shared in opposition to the identity of others. Now, if the electorate is the people, then populism tends to produce messianic expectations around every electoral round. Elections are no longer the test for the public approval of alternative policy platforms, but they're showdowns where the corrupt politicians are finally ousted by those who represent the people. And again, uh, President Trump's inaugural address, uh, I think, can be taken to exemplify this point if we uh, read one passage. Washington flourished, but the people did not share in its wealth. Politicians prospered, but the jobs left and the factories closed. The establishment protected itself, but not the citizens of our country. Their victories have not been your victories, their triumphs have not been your triumphs, and while they celebrated in our nation's capital, there was little to celebrate for struggling families all across our land. That change is starting right here and right now, because this moment is your moment, it belongs to you. 
Now, not only the presentification of the people as the current electoral body annihilates the historical depth of the people, which spans, in this case, or two centuries and, and, and more, but it essentializes the people as the nation. This marks the difference between mainstream monists, as uh, in jargon they're called, uh, uh, theories on, of parliamentary supremacy, majoritarian approaches to democracy, or so-called political constitutionalism, uh, think of, uh, thinking of uh, Richard Bellamy, and populism proper. So President Trump's electoral slogan significantly, significantly was make America great again, not make the United States uh, great again. And similarly, in France and in Italy, the rhetoric of the National Front or the Northern League is all about the defense of the nation. Uh, Marine Le Pen frames her presidential flame uh, platform, remettre la France en ordre, uh, put France back in order, in the name of the people. But already uh, 20 years before, uh, 20 years earlier, her father's uh, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen version of the National Front called for a priorité aux Français, the French first, in the allocation of jobs, housing, and social welfare. So from the standpoint of political liberalism, unreasonable is this reduction of the people to the electorate because it overlooks three other meanings of the expression, the people, that completely disappear from uh, the notion of the populist notion of the people. So first, populism casts out of sight. It obscures the people as the author of the Constitution over a time that spans from the initial framing to the latest amendment. The people in the name of which then uh, adjudication is carried out and whose will constitutional courts reconstruct in their arguments. Second, Many populist accounts fail to include the participating people. Uh, the participating people, those who are mobilized in social movements, who strike, demonstrate, protest through marches, sit-ins, and other activities, and who, through voice, so-called voice, contribute to the shaping of public opinion in a public sphere. The Five Star Movement in Italy goes some way towards including internet participants, but they reductively treat their own rank and file members as the only significant segment, uh, the only significant segment uh, of the participating people, and they ignore all the rest. Third, the people also designates, this expression also designates what is called by uh, uh, Rosa Malon, uh, the random people namely the sum total of all those who respond to polls run through random sampling. Their opinion counts very much and exerts a lot of influence over contemporary politics, as documented by a number of, uh, of uh, um, works in political theory. And these three different images of the people, so uh, the number-based electorate, the social people, the people who mobilize, then the people as a principle, those who stand behind the great clauses of the Constitution, and the random people, they jointly form an antidote to the poisonously simplistic notion of the people as the present day native, only native and national voters. The second uh, aspect of uh, Populism, impersonating the people, the electorate is the pro tempore constituent power. We should not equate the rise of populist forces with the rise of anti democratic attitudes, uh, because differently than uh, forms of populism uh, early in the 20th century, present day populism is not against democracy, but against liberalism. It worships majorities, electoral majorities but rejects all checks and balances that contain majorities. And in a way, populism revives an ancient split between liberalism and democracy, uh, which democratic theory of the late 20th century, especially deliberate democracy, had healed, as in the, in the phrase liberal hyphen democracy. 
against, uh, so post-democracy, the famous term coined by Colin Crouch, is a kind of wrong and misleading uh, label. Populism is majoritarian anti-liberalism or post-liberalism. Against the dualist picture of democracy advocated by Ackermann and in a different way by Rawls, uh, populism is instead strongly monist and majoritarian because the electorate is the people's current incarnation, the constitution is in the electorate hands. What this means concretely is, the, is that the judicial branch especially the constitutional court, or a supreme interpreter of what the constitution says, should be, in their view, uh, in the view of the populist view, responsive to the orientation and ways of thinking of the majority of the electorate. And such understanding of the relation of the constitution to prevalent opinion was aired even in the Supreme Court itself in the dissenting opinion of Justices Robert Scalia and Thomas in the case of Obergefell in 2015. They, the dissenters, pointed to the illegitimacy of five lawyers enacting their own vision of marriage as a matter of constitutional law and stealing, stealing this issue from the people. In their view, the court's opinion amounted to the, to the judicial creation of a new right to same-sex marriage, allegedly descending from the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, when the legislatures of more than half the states, elected by local majorities that add up to a national majority, had pronounced themselves against such right. That view is majoritarian, but not populist, in the absence of the other constitutive traits of populism. Now, from the perspective of political liberalism, this specific aspect of populism erodes the institutional anchoring of public reason in a supreme or constitutional court, as it is in roles, and confines reasonability to an occasional virtue of political actors as single persons or individuals. And this aspect of populism can be considered also unreasonable, not in the technical sense, uh, in the Rothschild sense, but unreasonable in a common sense, uh, 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 in a common sense uh, understanding of the term. Why? Because first, uh, it violates the common sense intuition that a conceptual and practical separation ought to exist between any game that we play and the rules that define the game. The idea that the rules of the game could be changed in the midst of a game and by the players themselves while they're playing the game uh, is deeply counterintuitive, in my opinion. And yet the notion of having constitutional essentials modified, not by special constitutional conventions, but by parliaments selected in regular interest-driven campaigns, where this is possible by the legal system, as the ruling parties unsuccessfully tried to do recently in Italy in a referendum uh, December last year, this view reflects this unreasonable anti-dualist conception of the electorate as endowed with constituent power. Second, common sense uh, way in which uh, populism is unreasonable, uh, the idea of constantly reinterpreting the constitutional essentials in light of the orientations of the electorate is to me self-defeating. A legal order with the living constitutions that promptly adopts the changing orientation of the majority of citizens is no different from a polity with no constitution at all, uh, just the majority rules. Populism leads to an implicit deconstitutionalization of our democratic polities. And the third sense in which it is commonsensically unreasonable uh, is that Distrustful though populists might be of constitutional constraints on majorities, populist forces will wish, presumably, to prevent their hard-won results from being overturned by the first electoral setback. And the temptation to rewrite the rules of the game so is very powerful. And it is hard to imagine, however, that no diversity of emphasis exists 
among populist forces. Uh, would the framers of, uh, if it could exist, a populist constitution carve in marble just one passing version of their ideas? Or would they not aim at a constitution capable of accommodating a slight diversity of emphases? Then they would be back uh, to imagining guarantees for plurality. And the element of unreasonability in this case lies in the unawareness that one's wish to make one's political values last over time cannot be fulfilled unless the notion of constitutionalism as a system of guarantees for plurality is used, is resorted to. Then the third and final feature of all forms of populism is the rejection of pluralism. Ivan Krastev has captured this aspect as the view that society falls into two homogenous and antagonistic groups, the people as such and the corrupt elite. Now, inverting uh, uh, Gaetano Mosca's and uh, uh, Wilfredo Pareto's and Roberto Michel's theory of elites, according to which uh, these were theorists of the early 20th century, according to which constant across diverse political regimes is only and always the vertical division between an organized minority of rulers and, and an unorganized silent majority of people that are variously taken advantage of, and that the principles of legitimation through which a political class or ruling elite demands compliance, such as rhetorical devices, uh, for securing obedience on the part of the forgotten man. Uh, against that, back, that background, populist forces try to mobilize the ruled, the majority against the ruling elite. And in such use of elections for punishing the political class, the protagonist is almost invariably an imaginary we, taken advantage of by disloyal elites and equally disloyal outsiders, immigrants, minorities, and so on. Distinctive of this anti-liberal, but not anti-democratic in my opinion, populism is a rejection of pluralism or a belief in what I call justified intolerance. Populism presupposes not only, like non-populist deliberative democracy, the existence of a knowable common good about which deliberation is turns. Uh, but also uh, that there is only one and only one proper common good to be discerned by the authentic people. And hence, there can be no such thing as a legitimate opposition. As one of the most insightful commentators on populism, Jan Werner Müller, points out, often populism harps on the Rousseauian theme of uh, the will of all not being the same as the true general will in order to question the results of regular elections. The examples are Orban in Hungary, Obrador in Mexico 2006, and also Berlusconi again 2006 when he lost the elections. All of them challenged the electoral results, uh, though in the end they bowed to legality. Justified intolerance derived from a rejection of the prudence of judgment and the epistemic humility that is mandated by them, explains another aspect of the populist outlook, impatience with internal dissent. The leader in chief reaches out directly to the rank and file, and there is less collegiality in decision making and a smaller number of intermediate organizational layers between the rank and file and the leader in chief. Uh, uh, thus, democracy uh, seen from the populist angle is no longer an arena where alternative elites compete for election, like in Schumpeter, or where different platforms for policy are debated, but morphs into a public space where one political actor is blessed by electoral success because it supposedly represents the true people or the nation's vision of the common good. And populism in this sense is a curious flip side of technocratic neoliberalism because both reduce the plurality of option to one right thing, one right interpretation of the popular will in the case of populism, or one right technical solution that eliminates the space for reasonable disagreement, as Margaret Thatcher would put it, uh, T 
Tina, there is no alternative. Uh, they both concur in this rejection of pluralism. Now, damage assessment, uh, 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 if we accept this uh, uh, outline of what populism is all about in its diverse forms, uh, then uh, another thing that we can draw from political liberalism and also from Habermas's version of deliberative democracy is a standard for assessing the amount of damage that this phenomenon has in, uh, inflicted onto uh, democratic polities. Both paradigms, the Rawlsian and the Habermasian, share a distinction between an institutional core of the polity, the public forum for Rawls, and strong publics for Habermas, where legislative, administrative, and judicial decision binding for all are made, and then a broader and less structured domain, the background culture for roles, the public sphere for Habermas, where deliberative exchanges take place and public opinion is formed. And in this outer space, <coughs> outer sphere, less stringent criteria of propriety apply. For roles, the standards of public reason are suspended. Actors are entitled to advocate their comprehensive conception over competing ones. And for both actors, certain requires dispositions, however, must be presupposed in order for the informal public sphere not to be disruptive of the democratic process. For roles, the epistemic humility generated by the acceptance of the prudence of judgment Tolerance, the virtue of civility, must be assumed for the background culture to work. And for Habermas, what qualifies a public space as a public sphere is a kind of disinterested interrogation, honest interrogation on the part of the participants uh, concerning the best answer to a given question. Now, in contexts where populist anti-liberalism instead has come to prevail, these attitudes are the first to fade away. We can then distinguish, uh, using these two paradigms, two cases of diverse gravity, so to speak, enfeebled democracies and post-liberal democracies. Enfeebled uh, democracies, weakened, weakened democracies, are those where populist justified intolerance has only infected the outer circle, the public sphere, or the background culture. The actors then no longer relate to one another as fellow inhabitants of a space of reasons who deliberate about what is best for them, about policies to be pursued, the way institution, institutions function, or any issue of common interest. They rather relate to one another as members of opposite fan clubs. They exchange insults, derogatory terms of address, and hardly exchange anything that resembles a reason. When this happens, the public sphere degenerates into a mere public space. This is a distinction between a public sphere and a public space, which I owe to a friend of, of mine, a fellow uh, political theorist, Walter Pulitera from Italy. And a, a mere public space like the stadium is. Think of the stadium. The stadium is certainly not a private place. It's a public space, but where publics only cheer their favorite teams and never cross their divides. Their communicative acts are only expressive and vent often intolerance of each other and each other. Now, one of the most poisonous fruits of the populist style of government is the polarization of society to such an extent that opposite camps clash no longer on policy, on political values, on different views about the implication of rights, but question each other's status as legitimate contender in the democratic arena. The charisma of populist leaders may wane over time, so it happened with Berlusconi in my own country, but their poisonous style lingers on. And it is difficult to, for constituencies now used to smearing their opponents as undignified enemies to ever backtrack into exchanging reasons uh, with them. So political adversaries can easily turn into enemies, but enemies rarely revert to being mutually recognizing adversaries. That's the thing. This is the single most severe damage inflicted to Italian democracy by the four Berlusconi governments between 1994 and 2011. 
Communism, long gone as a political movement of any substance after 1989, was still used in electoral campaigns as a term for delegitimizing the Democratic Party, eventually headed by Renzi, as an enemy of freedom, as though communism still existed. Politics, where this degeneration affects primarily the public sphere, but the public forum somehow continues to function according to standards of propriety, civility, and reasonableness, uh, can be described as enfeebled democracies. Post-liberal democracies, instead, are regimes in which indigenous unreasonability has infected the public forum. Through the demise of civility, principled intolerance, factionalism, the demonization of political adversaries. Usually, parliaments are affected first because of their elective nature and direct contact through the electoral campaign with the moods and feelings of public opinion. But once parliaments are filled with elected supporters of populism, it is a short step before they nominate populists in government, in government plots, where this is possible in parliamentary democracies, for instance. And the last institution to be reached on account of its mostly non-elective mode of recruitment, recruitment is the judiciary, with the exception of Venezuela now, which uh, is a matter for uh, rethinking this, this theory. Uh, this process takes place by way of a deep change in style in the operation of the public forum. Uh, what uh, Roseanne Vallone has called a democracy of interaction uh, slowly shrinks to a democracy of authorization. And in post-liberal democracies, an, an executive branch that aspires indeed to being unbound, to use the expression of Posner and Vermeu in, the, in their book, The Executive Unbound under, After the Medizonian Republic, um, an executive branch that aspires to being unbound on account of its superior ability relative to the legislative and ju judicial branches to keep abreast of events, to master a comprehensive view of the situation, to envisage and carry out rapid response measures, tries to bypass the such unbound executive all interaction with the other segments of the public forum and with significant intermediate bodies of civil society. Its aim of the executive unbound is to free itself from these fetters unfold its action above them, obtain tangible results, and then reach out directly to the electorate in search for acclamatory confirmation at the next elections. As Waldron, Jeremy Waldron, has been keen on emphasizing, the unbound executive uh, does not, as in the totalitarian regimes of the past, aims at suspending democratic elections, but rather at turning them into a publicitary showdown between enthusiastic supporters of the action of government and defeatist, nostalgic, corrupt defenders of the views that are contrary to the best interest of the nation. The preferred style is then what Bruce Ackerman has called government by emergency. The post-liberal executive uh, tries to cast itself as the savior of the national interest in some security or economic emergency, either of the two, uh, in an almost exclusively direct dialogue with the electorate and the public of polls. Accountability ceases to be then, in post-liberal democracies, a matter of checks and balances, and degenerates into plebiscitarian mass approval. Concluding, how can uh, liberal democracy respond to these to this challenge and we still have to see the results of the French elections uh, in a couple of weeks from now not simply by seeking to entrench constitu constitutionalism as we know it uh, I think the populist upsurge is a dubious response to real problems we need to explore its causes, not only the symptom. And two of its po possible co uh, uh, plausible causes are, in my opinion, the exponential growth of inequality in all advanced and emerging economies, and uh, B, what I call the new absolute power uh, that disembedded financial markets exert on democratic national legislatures. Uh, and we need to explore those 
causes. We'll live in societies where an increasing proportion of profits originates from financial gains, not from manufacture or services. Nothing is produced. Uh, in 2010, 40% of all profits in the US came from finance, so Stiglitz in, in an article of his. And this is an, an expanding trend. Uh, there's also another famous book, uh, Profiting Without Producing. Uh, during this momentous transformation towards financialization, the value of labor has constantly been diminishing as the share of the GNP uh, that can be uh, uh, brought back to labor. And the impact of this process uh, jointly caused by the technical rationalization and by the geopolitical availability of a global labor market goes well beyond the economic sphere. As it becomes flexible, precarious, underpaid, subcontracted, and outsourced, and outsourced uh, wage labor also becomes increasingly deunionized and loses the capacity to attract consensus. And this development massively impacts the electoral fortunes everywhere of the parties that historically have represented labor and opens opportunity windows for the indigenous unreasonability of populist leaders. At the same time, a deep turn toward inequality has occurred. Not only the income and wealth of the top 1% of the population has reached spectacular levels incomparable with the everyday reality of everybody else, as the social movements claiming to represent the 99% uh, testify, but a deep restructuring of the basis of inequality has been underway. This new inequality, uh, based on financial rent rather than profits from productive activities, has profound implications for democracy. And as Thomas Piketty has eloquently put it, put it in, uh, in his book, Capital in the 21st Century, uh, when the rate, and I'm quoting from him, when the rate of return on capital significantly exceeds the growth rate of the economy, then it logically follows that inherited wealth grows faster than output and income. Under such conditions, inherited wealth will dominate wealth amassed from a lifetime's labor by a wide margin, and the concentration of capital will attain extremely high levels, levels potentially incompatible with the meritocratic values and principles of social justice fundamental to modern democratic societies. Furthermore, financial activity has become ever, ever more disjoint from the measurable and material benchmark, any uh, uh, measurable and material benchmark in the real world. And since three decades, Finance produces profits no longer through facilitating investment, as it has been uh, traditionally the case, but through speculation on markets, which are global, disembedded from any national, regional, or industry context, and increasingly virtu virtual. And this is a further step uh, towards the disembedment trend explored by Polanyi in The Great Transformation. So, ironically, this is the basis, kind of basis of populism. The elusive philosophical chimera of the view from nowhere has finally incarnated itself in these markets and firms. This amendment from three things, from territorially based resources and manufacturing processes, B, from corporate social responsibility towards any locally situated stakeholder, and C, from tangible and verifiable fundamentals linked with the value of commodities, assets, stocks, market shares, and so on. The negative effects of this tribal disembedment for democracy are compounded by the volatility induced by lack of transparency and by the sheer quantitative volume of the markets. The aggregate value of the equities and derivatives being exchanged on the global market has been calculated uh, by the International Bank of Settlements based in ba Basel uh, to far exceed any material counterpart represented by material assets, real estate, commodities, in the order of, six, in the data of 2013, in the order of 693 trillion, the total amount of this financial 
uh, uh, equities uh, relative to a global GNP that ranges between 50 and 60 trillion. So to more than nearly 14 times. Uh, the rise now of indigenous unreasonability must be understood against the background of uh, this situation and the concomitant resurgence of a new kind of absolute power. The markets, once limited and subjected to the absolute power of the kings before constitutional, uh, uh, liberal constitutionalism, now wield an absolute power over the democratic polities. One may object to this thesis of the absolute power of financial markets that markets are constantly immersed in a web of regulatory provisions, some of statutory form, others having the form of guidelines, regulations, benchmarks, and so on. But the law itself is often, especially statutory law, uh, made in parliaments, formed in elections, influenced by corporate contributions and media. The law itself is often drafted in anticipation of what the markets, including crypto actors such as uh, rating agencies or pseudo-economic actors such as sovereign funds will like and are willing to accept. In this sense, one could say markets influence lawmaking more than law influences markets. Mm -hmm. And therein, in my opinion, lies the late modern absoluteness of their power. Uh, in an iconic, ironic, in an ironic replica of the relation of parliaments to kings before liberal constitutionalism, in the 21st century's century, governments and parliaments often aim at wooing the approval of the markets or staving off their disapproval because the key to electoral survival is the ability of one party or coalition to ensure prosperity or at least avoid financial downturns. Just as absolute monarchs could reject parliamentary lawmaking dissolve or convene parliaments, think of the tensions between the Stuart monarchy and the Westminster parliament in the 17th century, so today's markets have the power to withdraw legitimacy from democratic lawmaking by way of controlling prosperity, the prosperity around which the democratic electoral contest is fought. Seven governments in Europe have been brought down uh, by the pressure of the markets in the wake of the 2008 crisis. Uh, first in Portugal, 2009, then Spain, Zapatero, 2011, then Greece, Ireland, and Iceland, uh, 2009, then Italy, 2011, and Latvia, 2011 as well. Now, why am I uh, uh, going over this? Because I think that no taming of the populist upsurge can be envisaged unless rampant inequality and the absolute power of these embedded financial markets are offered some kind of remedy alternative to protectionist closure. Instead, center-left progressive parties have often flirted with the market's absolute power, promising to tame it in the general interest while in fact failing to represent those most, most exposed to it, and thus opening a window of opportunity for indigenous unreasonable parties and movements that advocate national culture. This is the moment of truth that we need to confront in the narrative of the forgotten man. The prospect for reclaiming liberal democracy, as opposed to populist democracy, is linked with the ability to offer an alternative response. And let me end on just one thought in that respect. Outlining such alternative response uh, depends, in my opinion, on jettisoning two dogmas of progressive thinking. The stigma, and these two dogmas are the stigma on consumption and second, mistrust of the law. Uh, many radical democratic critical theorists consider law the locus and propagator of a strategic habitus detrimental to social integration and understand so-called juridification as one of the main causes for widespread depoliticization. They overlook the fact that law has the advantage, crucial in our context, 
of not presupposing collective subjects, share narratives and memory in the way politics does. Law may presuppose some of these things when it is enacted by legislative assemblies composed of parties in electoral competition, but not when it functions as common law or when it is enforced. Furthermore, one socioeconomic function that has escaped fragmentation and has remained truly universal, though not highly regarded in critical circles, is consumption. Broadly understood, not consumerism, but uh, which is a, a cultural degeneration of, of, of this, but the function of consumption. We participate in social production in various capacities that are difficult, notoriously, to reconcile in an anti-hegemonic project. But we're all consumers. And in such role, we all face the alienating experience of being a dispensable atom, just one individual person, confronted with enormous economic forces. Private sector companies, utility companies, insurance companies, telecommunication companies, and other time regulatory agencies, rating agencies, banks, all these that dictate rules over which we have virtually no influence. Now, consumer protection has been constitutionalized in the European Union. Article 38 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, now included in the Lisbon Treaty, provides for a high level of consumer protection. Whereas uh, antitrust legislation is an application of the principle of equality in the sphere of economic relations among major actor, uh, market players, the aim of this article, Article 38, is to bridge the gap between the influence of the great market players and the single atomized consumer without falling back into the regressive utopia of the abolition of the market. Now, nothing prevents liberal Democrats, I think, from injecting a strong normative content substance into consumer protection through class action and from understanding class action, especially in legal systems that supplement it with punitive damages, not all of them do, is the implementation of a strong principle of equality that forces the market to truly vindicate the premises of, of the equal, the, the, premises, the premise of the equal standing of the contracting parties. Nothing prevents liberal democratic theorists from giving class action and punitive damages a new twist capable of representing that desired third course between populist neo-nationalist closure and neoliberal globalism. Nothing accepts our traditional image of class-based resistance to manufacturing against manufacturing capitalism uh, except that traditional image prevents us from turning class action into a flexible tool capable of affirming the value of equality. And nothing but prejudice against consumption prevents us from understanding this universal social and economic relation as a terrain of contestation. We're at stake, like precisely like when wage labor and exploitation held center stage, uh, where at stake is nothing less than the principle of equality. Equal protection of the laws needs to acquire a new meaning beyond racial and gender equality, one connected with equality of opportunity in the market. Now consider financial prime movers as rating agencies. Standard & Poor, Fitch, Moody's, among others, all purport to sell their capacity for reliable assessment of the prospects of institutions, banks, governments, and financial products but they often affect the reality that they claim to observe and analyze. Standard & Poor famously downgraded the US sovereign credit rating in April 2011, and not a controversial decision given that the other agencies didn't concur. Uh, and also Standard & Poor downgraded Spain in October 2012 and bashed the so-called Eurobonds yet to be issued by the Central European Bank, they bashed them as trash before they existed, so hardly an observation. And finally, in the aftermath of Brexit, 
Standard & Poor downgraded the credit rate of UK. An example now of class action led by local government comes from Australia. An eight-year battle, legal battle between the city of Swan in Western Australia and Standard & Poor over misleading conduct in the handling of ratings prior and during the collapse of Lehman Brothers has involved a group of 92 members led by the city of Swan and Marie Plains Share in uh, New South Wales. And among these claimants were investors, councils, churches, and charities. Democracy is incompatible with impunity, and impunity, impunity is the prime feature of absolute power. The reclaiming of democracy for democratic citizenry begins, I think, with holding these and other actors accountable, these and other actors like sovereign funds, for instance, accountable through government-sponsored class actions, combined where possible with punitive damages, Government-sponsored class actions aimed at compensating citizens unduly damaged by so-called ratings that fall below the standards of independence and reliability. Now, one could dismiss these lawsuits as internal to the logic of an instrumental use of the law subservient to the neoliberal hegemonic credo. But the burden of proof, I think, is on radical new Marxist critics to show that under present conditions of hyperpluralism, of flexibilization of work, of fragmentation of social classes, and of lack of a counter-hegemonic comprehensive vision, understandably absent in times of post-metaphysical thinking, under all these conditions, it is possible to oppose financialized capitalism more effectively through traditional street demonstrations, petitions, strikes, press campaigns, and so on. Until their case is convincingly made, the demand for protection need not be left in the hands of populist forces, but may take a form very different from legislation enacted in the wake of classical protest movements. Namely, it could take the form of successfully argued legal cases that proceed from the global constitutionalism of human rights and from interlocking court, court judgments. In the end, the growth of indigenous unreasonability has not yet called, I think, uh, the democratic horizon in question. It has subverted the important aspects of it and constitutes certainly a new inhospitable condition with which democratic regimes must reckon in our historical context. And uh, liberal democracy, however, cannot be properly rescued, rescued unless these new inhospitable conditions for democracy are addressed in an efficacious way. And unless equal protection of the laws is reinterpreted as a third course between the center-left complacent acquiescence to neoliberalism, and on the other hand, the populist promise of remedial closure against globalization. Thank you for your attention.